Can I kick, kick off with a question for Dr. Zogby? Yes. Um, Definity in the use of the ICU patients. Is there a patient that you consider uh, too sick to, you know, that makes you reticent about using Definity, or what guidelines do you use in your institution, patients that are hemodynamically unstable or hypoxic or what have you? Thank you for the question. I think there is no issue about safety. Uh, you know, there, there were many, many trials to try to uh, see if there is a specific population that we need to avoid. And if you've been in this field for some time, there used to be a black box warning about various issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And pretty much, except for allergy, uh, there is really no black box warning anymore on any of these, on any of these drugs. We use them in the sickest heart failure patients, VADs, I mean, you name it. And I think it is a drug, so you're not going to use it on every patient. But I, I think uh, you know the appropriateness. I think is very important. Whenever you're not going to be able to diagnose patients, particularly in the ICU, this is really your best modality to do that for ventricular function. Other questions for um, this great panel? Come on, you all have got. Uh, you got to have some questions. I mean, we saw some. Some. We yes, have one sir. at the front. We have one at the front. I'm at the front. <laughs> On the screen. Okay. So, what is the cheapest? POCT echo, point of care ultrasound, was that the question? I guess so. All right, so Roberto, Target. that's commercially available. Is that the stethoscope, Roberto? <laughs> I can sell you mine. Uh, I, I think that in the, as I see it now, this new device, the one that does not use crystals, but device this electronically way of uh, generating the, the ultrasound has the lowest price because, you know, the, all the companies are also looking for different types of models. Some companies are also trying to rent you this and that you pay every month. And there are many, many, everybody's trying to, to see what is the best way. But I think this new company, it's called Butterfly, right. probably has the one that has the cheapest... Uh, uh, and I think maybe has the largest potential in the yeah. marketplace. And I, th I think that's a valid point. There are currently four uh, startup companies that are pretty far along that have got some very dramatic miniaturized uh, ultrasound devices. And, and I think that's the, that's because price has been an issue. I mean, there's no doubt if you've got a $10,000, which was the GEV scan, which was a great instrument, it's, it's very difficult for every one of us to have a $10,000 Echo machine, Roberto. Yeah, no, I, I personally, I don't know what you, what, what the panel thinks, but you know, we as physicians, when you work in your hospital, you buy your own stethoscope, right? No, but the hospital is not buying your stethoscope. So you go, you spend three hundred dollars, and you buy your stethoscope. Now, when you buy these machines, now they're talking about ten thousand dollars and so on. So then you always try for the hospital to buy it, and then the hospital buys it or not accordingly. But uh, this for me is only going to take off when a physician will decide to buy this because the price is sort of something that you will buy to have yourself. If you're depending on the hospital to buy it, I don't think this is going to truly take off. But, but interestingly enough, I really think as our healthcare system is changing, I think there will be incentive for hospital systems to actually buy it for physician and train them because it will expedite length of stay. And uh, but I think education, just like you emphasized, Roberto, is going to be very important if you if you take this beyond the specialist echocardiographers. Obviously, the intensivists also are going through a phase of training, etc. But I, I think education and training is crucial because it could be actually even more dangerous than a stethoscope Correct. if you don't know how to use it. <laughs> and, and, and I think starting in medical school, you know, younger kids, they love pushing buttons and they're really good at it. And uh, they, know you know, they can do buttons. with a phone what, <laughs> what we are trying to learn, they can do in seconds. So, and they get it. So I think we also need to change the way that we teach physical you know, examination to students in medical schools. All right. We could go on. I mean, it's, it's fabulous technology. It's going to be here. There's no doubt about it. It will improve diagnosis, especially if you move it into the 
nurse practitioner and the and, and it's not going to threaten our jobs. It's going to improve our ability to take care of patients. Next question. Uh, the one that was there the longest ago uh, disappeared. So let me ask, since we'll, get all, we'll come back, what's the technical adjustment do you suggest to reduce artifacts while performing cardiac MRI in patients with pacers and ICD? Joel? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So as I mentioned briefly, there are a few things to be aware. Uh, location of the generator, if it is on the left side, it's going to be a little bit more artifact. Obviously, we cannot ask for that. It's, it's already there by the time we get it. Uh, the second thing is to change the regular sequence that you use for image acquisition from uh, SSFP to gradient recall echo with EPI. That reduces the inhomogeneity. Uh, the, second, the third thing is to use, obviously, shim boxes. And the fourth would be to be, um, you know, talking to your company, the, the magnet, for these wideband sequences. Um, there is a very good development into that order to really minimize uh, the artifacts that come with that. Great, good. So um, let's ask Dan. What's what's is there a shortage? Is there still a shortage of isotopes? And um, does that stress imaging help to minimize the shortage? Well, I think at this time there's no significant problem with the availability of the isotopes. The main thing that stress-only imaging gives us is this dramatic reduction in radiation, uh, which uh, with the modern systems uh, can get down to the level of one to two millisieverts, as John mentioned. In our lab, about 40% uh, percent of our cases are having stress-only images at this time. Good. Excellent. So, Bill or Roberto, how do you teach? Uh, reproducibility of 3D echo, uh, uh, 3D echo in labs that have not incorporated it there. Well, um, that's a, actually a very good question. I, I, I think a good way to start is to, in your lab, to maybe initially identify one or two of your sonographers that will start doing this, and uh, they have to start doing it and measuring it, and then you start to compare yourself with, with cardiac MRI, and then these will come the teachers of the teachers. So, I mean, I think also, I mean, I show you nice pictures, and that's great, but, you know, when you take the real-time patients, you know, like, uh, obviously, Pittsburgh, also here, but also in Chicago, everybody has a, everybody's big. You know, we can to get obtain good 3D echoes in about maybe 70% of the patients if you know what you're doing. So I, I think it is definitely something that if you're not doing, that it's a definitely a good thing to start exploring. This is with all the vendors. They all have beautiful software. Many of the vendors are exploring automated ways to analyze it. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good way to start thinking about this. All right. Go ahead, Bill. I will add something, uh, Roberto, you, your experience with that. If, if some of the industry people are here, we really need to optimize also contrast use with 3D. And I think this is an, for ventricular function. We're not looking at other things. But for ventricular function, I think it would be great to optimize them so they can go together and improve your overall ventricular function assessment, particularly in technically difficult patients. Yeah. Joel, there's a good question here because I think it's very, very important. MRIs. Great for volumetric assessment, but but this uh, questionnaire questioner says surgical decision is largely based on echo. What's the future of CMR for MR? And there was just a lead article on this. Yeah, Jack, imaging. Uh, Jack uh, a couple weeks ago from uh, Seth Ratsky. Um, this is a phenomenal question and, and hits near dear my heart. That's one of my areas of passion is valvular heart disease and how MRI. We actually have started um, the, this past SCMR working group in valvular heart disease to really push the agenda on how we can integrate this better. I mean, the work that Deepan does here, it's uh, you know paramount. And, now, particularly for regurgitant lesions, mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, there's a great deal that we could use CMR to arbitrate and to adjudicate decision to intervention. And TR. And TR, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are looking at symptoms and we're looking at two dimensions, which, you know, as Dr. Uh, Lang mentioned, this is incredible variability. And uh, we, it's not uncommon that we came with patients with aortic insufficiency, and by the time they come to operation, the ventricle is quite dilated. And some of them will come back, but some of them will struggle. For reproducibility, 
Um, CMR might be better than echo reproducibility? Absolutely, for yeah, for reproducibility, and particularly for mitral regurgitation. Yeah. yeah, for mitral regurgitation, there is a great deal about overestimation of severity of mitral regurgitation by echo because we, on the PISA measurement, for example, we assume that that radius is going to be constant throughout the entire systole, which actually changes throughout. There is work done by Dr. Manny Van and others showing that, you know, by 3D, um, you know, transesophageal, transthoracic, we might be able to change the shape of that piece and have a better accuracy. But um, this is something that we need to be mindful of. So we're get, we're building questions. There will be a session tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow on all valvular heart disease. So we'll we'll go through that. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. Hey, Dan, is is nuclear medicine ejection fraction or eje echo ejection fraction most accurate? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's. Uh, <laughs> Probably depends uh, for the echo part in terms of who ha in whose hands these are being done. Uh, there are many uh, uh, many situations that, that I think are difficult for measuring ejection fraction that nuclear gets around. Uh, but nuclear has its own uh, limitations of resolution. I think o overall the techniques are are fairly comparable. So so Joel is is. Uh MR, CMR, the way to do ejection fraction? Does it not have any limitations? No, I, I think we have to, you know, if you have good 3D echo images, um, you, you good in the cardio border that you do not need to use contrast, be confident with that. Um, you can drive. I mean, the volumes are going to be smaller than MRI, but that's okay. I mean, as long as we are in the same ballpark. Um, but I think we have to also be humble to be um, cognizant that of their limitations, as Dr. Lang mentioned, you know, for shortening both on echo and NCMR as well. If you don't acquire the image as well, you're going to overestimate. So it, it goes both ways. Um, but I think, you know, at this point, CMR is considered to be the gold standard because of the capability of uh, visualizing that. Uh, again, a real development would be when we are able to do three-dimension CMR imaging. As of right now, we have a three-dimensional heart, but guess what? We slice it into 2D, right? So we are dumbing it down. You know, CT, for example, could be. I mean, th the major issue with ejection fraction that you see every day with echocardiography is particularly in individuals with regional wall motion abnormalities. Right. The extremes are easy. You know, if a ventricle is very depressed with an ejection of the 20% or completely normal, th this is not what, what going to differentiate your lab from somebody else. Where the issues are, are the ones in between, that they have maybe a wall motion abnormality in the apex, a little bit at the base. So you have, I mean, so 2D point of view, at times you may overemphasize the good segments or de-emphasize, you know, the good uh, segments depending on your cut. So this is where 3D echo would be very important whenever you have so many different regional wall motion abnormality. And also you're gonna have to incorporate, you know, the various views so you have a better view and better interpretation of the overall function. Use Doppler, use many other things to help you to see what the stroke volume is, what the ejection fraction. So it becomes more difficult with echocardiography in the interim. Uh, and, and, and that's why you need to use 3D technologies to try to help. And there's a tremendous, I mean, we're going to learn a lot about the right ventricle, but right ventricular function becomes a big issue, and RV ejection fraction volumes are very important in CMR. Dan, we've got, I want to get yeah, to there a couple Just here. to mention that the, the nuclear and CT methods are, uh, methods are inherently three-dimensional. Correct. That's one advantage, and when you look at CT, you can do a CT ejection fraction with exquisite definition in 3D data of the endocardium. So uh, it probably challenges MR in terms of being a gold standard for ejection Excellent. fraction. Excellent. So Bill, you've got fabulous sonographers here in, in uh, Texas, and, in, uh, and, all, and we, our sonographers are fabulous colleagues for us in an echo lab. So can a sonographer start an IV and inject contrast? Is that within the scope of their practice? It's not necessarily in the scope of practice of, sono of sonographer unless they get trained in that. So I'll tell you our journey and, and the practical portion of it is initially we said, well, I think we should train our sonographers to start IVs and uh, maybe get the, them a, a focused area of being able to inject contrast. And uh, yes, it's a drug. At times you can have an anaphylactic reaction, which is very, very rare, but you know, it, it is a medical, it is a drug. So we went through that, 
And I think to tell you the truth, from an efficiency point of view, to a lab, a large laboratory, it didn't really help us much because you always have help. Inpatients have an IV already. And if you're on portables and the nurses are, you know, you, in, you have to instruct them as to how to use, you know, contrast and they work as a team. So actually we kind of gradually shied away from them starting IVs and doing the contrast and actually, you know, the nurses, if they need to start an IV and, uh, and the nurse inject while they're concentrating on acquisition of, of uh, these data because they have to acquire. And it's not a single injection. Remember, you, you inject first time and then you may have to add a little more, add a little more while you're doing it. So yes, it could be, but from a practical point of view, I think it's better to work as a team with a laboratory where there's a nurse. Okay. How do you guys do it? And, and no, we, we do exactly as you said, you know, we, we thought about having them start the IV access and doing all of that, but it's a teamwork and the majority of time we have a very low threshold to have them inject contrast. The decision is made by them. I think it's a better, I mean, we also try to teach our sonographers, but then when you teach them for a sonographer to do an IV, it's almost like doing brain surgery. So it takes a lot of time. So it makes, it's more efficient if you do it with a nurse, in my opinion. So we, we have nurses and then they work together to inject contrast. All right, well, we've got some other good, good questions, but I think we're gonna go to a break. Uh, Roberto, point of care ultrasound systems do they have? They don't have CW Doppler, do they have Doppler? Yes, it depends, you know, there are many, as I showed you, there are many versions. Some of the more, more actually even expensive versions have color Doppler right. and they have pulse. Uh, these newer versions of a hand, or the one that connect to a phone with a transducer, they don't. All right, great session this morning. Take a coffee break, come back at 10.30.